At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Well, welcome to the Author Brand Show today. We've got lots of rational thoughts and cool stories to talk about. Um, we've got a guy in today who is a former college athlete who was forced into retirement because of major injury. It happens a lot. Um, and with school not being his, you know, strength, he utilized his real skills as he learned as an athlete to build one of the fastest growing independent financial planning firms in the Southeast. Now, of course, we all know what happened when, when COVID hit, world shut down. But this guy saw an opportunity and he seized it. He authored a financial literacy and platform, which maximizes a, a book, actually, for college athletes, which led to him starting another business, partnering with athletic departments, conferences, and governing athletic bodies to eradicate financial illiteracy, especially amongst collegiate athletes. So with uh, all due respect, my guest today, Mr. Ryan Schatchner. Ryan, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Outstanding. Man, I, I, I got to tell you, I'll just to be really transparent for people watching the show, I was a journalist that was, that was honored to interview Ryan for this book. And if you think you know the backstory on professional athletes and finances, you only know the tip of the iceberg there because yeah, I learned a go. whole lot in that book, man. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Just great stuff. So before we get into the show here, I um, want to ask a couple questions. What can people get out of this today? from listening to us, yeah, for, for 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is life always deals us obstacles, right? And perhaps the biggest obstacle with COVID came, you know, two years ago, year and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, when everything looked bleak in my financial planning business, um, mm -hmm. it was just taking a step back and being able to look at the rough times and analyze it and see opportunity and then to take action to, you know, go and, and make things happen when, you know, the world looked like it was going to halt forever. Especially in the, in the, you know, athlete, I mean, it's closing down stadiums, events, and that was major. I mean, it's, um, but that was, but you were, but your financial planning business wasn't really, was it really focused on that at that time prior to 2020? Uh, in perfect, you know, we had a few um, athletes that were clients, right. but it wasn't yeah. a focus. I mean, we dealt right. with more general public retirement planning and businesses yeah. and that sort of thing. But the first two months of COVID, we couldn't get anybody to pick up the phone. And so, you know, it was more, yeah, it was more, I, you know, I got to figure out something to do. I can't just sit right. here and, you know, binge watch Netflix and, and that, you know, I, got, I have to be productive. And so right. that's where right. the book came in and, and uh, you know, yeah. all of this, you know, brand new business just kind of exploded. Yeah, it sure has. We'll talk about that in a second. So if someone's going to watch this, this um, they're going to learn about, I don't know, do you, you like using that word pivoting, a pivot? You know, I, we can use whatever word. I'm, I'm pretty easy. What word do you so. want to use, man? I, I don't like it. That's personal. I'm being, I'm being a snarky person. What do you like? You found the opportunity. I mean, you. Yeah, I think it's just operating with your eyes open and, yeah. and, um, you know, being aware of the surroundings and and right. current events and and then just taking advantage of those. That's beautiful. That's brilliant. That's really the thing is keeping your eyes open. I think a lot of people, they they see what you know, are. You know, our brain's wired to look for danger, right? So they see danger and they go, oh, and they're either deer in the headlights or they fight or flight. Um, and you took a role rational saying, okay, there's this pandemic thing. Now what am I going to do? And what was it that got you to say, hey, I'm going to focus on this one niche of just collegiate athletes. Why was that? Why? Did, where did that come from? So I had met with a, a right before the world shut down. I had a uh, basketball player from UNC Charlotte reach out to me asking for an internship. And when I interviewed him back when you could still meet face to face without like a hazmat suit, um, it, you know, he was really sharp. And within 10 seconds, I knew I was going to hire this guy. I just needed to find the position. Right. And I started asking him financial questions and just basic stuff, right? Not how to trade on margins or any of that type of stuff. Just basic, yeah. you know, what is credit? How do you budget? And he just, yeah. it was just like a deer in the headlights. And so from there, you know, I reassured him that I was going to give him a position, but he still didn't yeah. have an answer. And I very quickly. Put so he together, swept floors for six months. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I very quickly put together that, man, these, yeah. these college athletes, yeah. they're not getting financial literacy training. 
or yeah. education or, or anything. And, you know, at the time, the name, image and likeness was still, you know, it was passed in a couple states where college athletes could get paid for, you know, yes. for being in college yeah. and playing sports. Uh, mm -hmm. But it wasn't, you know, the, it wasn't live yet. It was, it was about to be, but no one really knew. Right. Right. And so that was going on. And I just said, you know, and, and then I just kept getting connected to more and more mm -hmm. athletes. And uh, I was hearing the horror stories of when they went pro and what was going on in college. And I just yeah. said, here's an opportunity that nobody is taking advantage of. We'll, we'll get to that part in a minute. It's not probably the, the meat of what I want to talk about. But for people who don't understand what you said a minute ago, using leveraging your name, image, and likeness, uh, people think they see all the millions being spent on college um, sporting events and all that stuff. But up until recently, it wasn't that with the players were just college kids, right? Yeah, you could get a scholarship. And, you know, there was probably money exchanging hands, you know, and, you know, behind the scenes and not legally. Right. But you know, I think the argument that the players were making and which was pretty hard to argue against was that the NCAA is making billions and billions of dollars. This industry, right. college athletics, football, basketball is a you know multi-billion dollar industry yeah. and it's built on the backs of these athletes and very few are going to become multi-millionaire right. professionals. I mean, there's the la there's a laundry list of names that were mm -hmm. you know notable college athletes that either didn't make it pro or you know were there for a year or two, got injured, and now they're yeah. out working normal jobs like you and I. You know, it kind of reminds me of um, you know gladiators, right? They're like these slaves; they got to go and fight and be the entertainment for all these pe rich people or whatever. And uh, yeah, they, they either they either die or they're just slaves. At least, not to saying college kids are slaves, but compared to professional athletes that you know can. When 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 they have financial literacy, of course, yeah. they can uh, re retire after even a short career. Um, all right, so you saw, and then so that that's that whole rule is changing now, right? They they are able to leverage their name, image, and likeness, or is it still state by state now, or what is it for? No, it's 21? it's the NCAA adopted it, and so it's all divisions mm -hmm. one, two, three, NAIA, junior right. college, you know, division one you can get paid or, you know, you can represent a brand as a college athlete and, nice, and yeah. make money doing it. And there's some deals out there. I mean, there are two twins out in California, uh, yeah. female basketball players that signed one of the first deals. It was like a million dollar deal. And so there's some real mm -hmm. money being thrown out there at, uh, at, at these athletes. So I thought all the, I thought the, 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 there was a lot of people complaining about the women's basketball stuff that they weren't getting enough play and, and money. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stats out there that talk about, <laughs> Uh, be, and a lot of it's based on social media following and yeah. female athletes tend uh -huh. to have a larger social media following. And so the yeah. the athletes that, you know, could potentially benefit the most out of this could be uh, the yeah. female athletes. So I would love to have the, the trading cards for the beach volleyball players. That'd be awesome. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So so that's a good that's a good shift for them. I'm glad I'm glad the kids are able to, um, you know, make some make some coin along the way. Um, but the premise of your book, and I want you to, you know, give us some stats and tragic stories here about there's two, there's two things in play. There's the, the dream of going pro and being, you know, getting all this fame and fortune. And then there's the reality of what really happens. So let's talk about that first. And then I want to talk about what happens if you, um, after the fact on both those two scenarios. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So if, if you look at the NCAA right now, there's mm -hmm. around 550,000 student athletes. And you're probably across all sports, including Olympians and all that, mm -hmm. out of that population, 550,000, you're maybe going to get 12,000 of those that get to yeah. go and play professional sports and, and make mm -hmm. money for actually playing, uh, right. playing sports at a pro level. Yeah. So it's very, very few. Yeah. And they're, and they're at the, at the, these 550,000, there are the, these are like the best of the best. Yeah, I mean, if you if you filter that out, right? You're talking about yeah. there's all the the high school student athletes that playing you know playing high school ball or whatever you right. want to go play pro or you right. want to go Division One or play in college. But even yeah. out of that population, you know, just to shrink down, which sounds bizarre mm -hmm. to say, but to shrink down to five hundred fifty thousand, I mean, you're yeah. talking about millions and millions yeah. of high school athletes that don't even get to that next level. And then right. to go to the co collegiate to then try and make it pro, 
I mm. mean, it's it's just gets shrunk down so yeah. much that. Yeah, the, the odds are probably, you should probably do the math in it. I'm guessing the odds are pretty close to like lottery level from high school to pro. Oh, yeah, like absolutely. <laughs> it has to be, yes. But there's so much media and hype and dreams and the American, yes, you can do anything you want in this world, which uh, if you don't mind sharing your journey, that might be a good good to segue into like, hey, man, I'm really good at, at baseball, right? Oh, yeah. So, you know, growing up, I was a baseball player and, you know, had a lot of attention, even from professional scouts from age 13 um, on up. You know, I didn't have power. You know, I grew up in the power era where if you didn't hit a gazillion home runs, then, you you know, you weren't. And I wasn't big enough to hit home runs in high school and all that. So I needed to go to college. I went to college one year at the end of my freshman year trying to get bigger and improve. I completely mm -hmm. blew out my shoulder and yeah. it was a career ending injury. And, yeah. but I was told, and a lot of these athletes, you know, we, we may start at different places, but once we enter into the world of sports, we share a lot of the same uh, mm -hmm. experiences. And so I was told I was going to be part of this, you know, 1% yeah. of 1%. And so that was my focus going into school and or lack of focus when it came to school. It was, <laughs> this is just, a you know, a means to get to the end, which is a pro yeah. athlete. And I've got to show up to class and I've got to, I have to pass. Right. So, you know, yeah. C's to me were like A's, right. I, I loved them. And, uh, but you know, that doesn't get you, you know, you know, high level jobs should a shoulder injury happen. And so shoulder yeah. injury happened got a uh, internship in the financial services space, really at that point had no interest in it, but it was a top yeah. 10 internship. And so I viewed it as a resume builder, showed right. up day one at this internship. And quite frankly, I was the dumbest person there. And they, you had people from, you know, <laughs> University of Wisconsin, Marquette, uh, yeah. you know, big institutions. And I'm here, you know, small division two school that Quite frankly, I didn't even hear of until I, you know, was recruited there, uh, and yeah. it was a local school. So, you know, and I, you know, very intimidating, especially from someone that didn't pay attention too much in school and didn't excel yeah. in that space. But I took the skills that I learned as an athlete, and I figured mm -hmm. out, hey, I can use these to be super successful in this space. Mm -hmm. And yeah, at the end of that internship, not just in my internship class locally, but across the nation, I was in the top ten out of you know, about oh. 1200 interns, uh, oh. I was in the top 10 of and And so it made me realize that, uh, it, or I proved to myself that you didn't have to be book smart to necessarily make it and get what you want. And the skills, you know, I, I had been trained starting from age six, playing baseball and other sports mm -hmm. on up how to be successful in life. I just yeah. didn't know that it, that, that it would bleed into each other. So do you have like a, a laundry list of some of those skills that you were able to transition and apply from athleticism to business? Yeah. I mean, there, there's a ton of them, but I, I would say my favorite is the ability to know how to lose. And so what I mean by that is, you know, a, a lot of kids that don't play sports, if something negative happens to them, yeah. they, they shelter, right? It's like the fetal yeah. position. And, mm -hmm. but as an, as an athlete, you're trained that, Man. you know, you're not going to win every at bat, right? So it, you, the stat is if you hit, uh, if you're in the major leagues in baseball and you get a hit three out of 10 times, you're going to be in the hall of fame. Well, that means right. seven right. out of 10 times you didn't get a hit, right? You failed yeah. seven out of 10 times. And so you just mm. naturally know how to bounce back from, you know, having losses. So I would say mm -hmm. that's my favorite one. But, mm -hmm. you know, knowing how to delegate, knowing how to work as a team, uh, knowing how to take charge and be a leader, mm -hmm. you know, those are definitely traits that you learn as an athlete um, right. in order to be successful at high school, but collegiately and, and most definitely once you get to the pros. Right, right. And I've talked to you and a couple of people um, in that in this space. Right. And I gotta, gotta add discipline. Um, you know, oh, yeah, either, as, as an yeah. employee, employer, entrepreneur, doesn't matter. Um, my, the best people I've worked with in my business are people with discipline, you know, athletes and veterans. You guys are just like, okay, it's two o'clock. You're there exactly two o'clock. Everything happens exactly as you plan. Cause you're disciplined to, you know, do what you're saying you're going to do. What a concept. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't, you were in laps. Right. And so that's right. That's right. 20 push-ups, Right. Yeah. Um, 
So let's get it. I want to hear some of these stories for our, our, our viewers today. Um, I was so shocked by these guys who are making, you know, a lot of money when they get there. They do go pro. Those, those 12000 that they get to that point. Um, you mentioned some stories of people buying like, you know, three or four Rolls Royces and stuff and, and then not being able to pay their tax bill and stuff. What's I the, mean, what's the, there's a, we have so many stories in the book, but give me like one of the top one or two to stand out for you. Well, so I think to start that off, you know, just because you make it pro doesn't mean you're an automatic multimillionaire. I mean, right. we, you know, when we think of pro player, we think of like the Tom Brady's or the yeah. Michael Jordan's and those right. are really the 1% of the 1% of the 1% that make it pro. Yeah. And so the majority of these athletes, they're, mm -hmm. they're making, now it's not insignificant by any means, but they're making a half million dollars a year. They've got a two yep. or three year deal and then they're out of the league, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think the one of my favorite ones, and he's pretty famous for talking about it, is Shaquille O'Neal. You yeah. know, when he got his first advance, first million dollars, he spent it, <laughs> spent a million dollars in an hour. A million dollars in an hour. That's a, that a movie with Richard Pryor, isn't it? <laughs> he bought his he bought his Mercedes S550. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, his dad said, well, where's mine? And then his mom said, but well, you can't buy one for dad and not buy it for mom. And so all of a sudden there's a number of cars that are that are gone. <laughs> uh, you know, that that you know he he just paid for, right? A million dollars right. gone. Right. One of my favorite stories about Shaq, though, is when he went from the Orlando Magic to the Lakers yeah. and he flies out there and um, he's walking around. He's got, you know, big, big guy, but he's walking yeah. around in sweatsuit. He stops yeah. in at a Rolls Royce dealership yeah. and uh, the the salesman is like, hey, you know, these cars are like three hundred thousand a piece. Right. And uh, and he's like and you got the hint that the sales guy didn't you know, he didn't think he could afford it. So yeah. he bought two in cash right there. Yeah. Just to prove to the guy that he could afford it. And then he went and bought a house. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like an 18 million dollar house cash yeah. boom, done. His accountant calls him. I think he got like a, <laughs> it was something like 30 million dollars, you know, was the first that, you know, paycheck he got was 30 million. Right. His accountant says, uh, hey, you you only have like a million dollars to make it to the next pay run. And he's like, what do you mean? I've made 30 million. I've only spent 20. And and he's like, yeah, but you're in California now. Like half yeah. of that is gone. Like you're, you're not this isn't Florida anymore. So <laughs> he had to somehow he had to make a million dollar stretch like two or three weeks in order. Well, to, he started doing yeah. commercials for the, the general, right? The insurance yeah. company. <laughs> But here, you know, that's a great story of, you know, he made mistakes, but now yeah. one of his biggest missions is to give back and to teach, yeah. you know, uh, athletes and, and just in general, people mm -hmm. about how to make smart money decisions and, and that sort of thing. So, right. you know, that, those right. are one of the guys that could rebound from it because of the mm -hmm. endorsements and, and the multi-year yeah. contracts, right? right? Very few of these guys can. A lot of them get taken advantage of because they're so focused on, I got to get my next contract. I want to make playing time. And yeah. they trust people that they shouldn't trust. And it's all of a sudden bad investments or they get put on the hook for, you know, bad real estate deals. And, yeah. you know, and, and they're, they're ruined. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, um, I, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of pressures from, you know, family and uh, different people in your life too. It's, it's hard when you're, uh, you know, new money, right. Nouveau riche. It's, yeah, it's gotta, absolutely. It's gotta be tough. Um, so there's another part of the book, which I find extremely fascinating, which, okay. So if you make it, you know, don't be, don't be stupid, you know, be smart about it, but don't forget about all those that don't. Cause you've got, like you said, you, you go into college saying, Hey, I got a scholarship. You know, my next step is, is the gold, you know, the brass ring. But if you don't get there and you don't have the financial literacy to move forward, it's kind of a challenge, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and the vast majority are not going to make it uh, at the pro level. And so, you know, it's helping them identify that their identity is not just as a student athlete or an athlete, because most of them, and I was guilty of it, that's how they viewed themselves. And once they realize that they have these skills that translate into being successful in any line of business that they want to get into, then it's just applying themselves while they're in school and using the platform that they have while they're a collegiate athlete to set up opportunities for when they, you know, whenever their athletic career is done. 
And so, you know, it's, it's really, it's treating athletics or going D1 or going pro, not as the destination, but as the launching pad to doing something bigger and better down the road. Right. Because I mean, the average athletic career lasts how long? Three you know, to five years. If they're lucky, yeah. five years, you're an old man. Right. I mean, that's a pretty narrow window. I don't care how much money you're making. That's a very narrow window. If you can live to be, you know, 90 or something like that, you're going to run out of money. You better that's have like some... a quarter of your life is, is, yeah. you know, is you're out of your sport at 25. You still yeah. have three quarters of your life to live. Right. So give us some fundamentals of what, what you should, what you can teach people. Let's say I'm a, a parent watching this and my, my high school kids just getting scouted by a college, whatnot, are all excited about this. Hey, you know, the college university came by, they're looking at my son. It looks really good. All this excitement about his athleticism. What can you teach kids about money at an early, at a young age when they're thinking about beer money and, and cars and stuff? Yeah. And, and, and girls and having fun and, yeah, and all that. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's really, it's, it's identifying and helping them understand that the math behind mm -hmm. when, you know, I don't want to shoot down any kid's dreams, right? Like I'm big on thinking big and, right. and, and so I'm going to assume that they go pro, mm -hmm. but let's just take the average of five years at 25, you're, you're done. You're not a pro anymore. Mm -hmm. And so now you have the rest of your life that, you you know, odds are you're not going to make enough money to live mm -hmm. on for the rest of your life. Right. So mm -hmm. let's look at the opportunities, opportunities you have as a high school athlete, the connections you can make, the relationships you can build, mm -hmm. even a collegiate athlete, the platform that you have to reach out, connect with alumni, build relationships, you know, explore different careers mm -hmm. so that when you are done with your sport, whenever that happens, now you have relationships you can go to and you have options for, you know, life after, uh, after ball. And so it's just embracing that, that you're, you're going D1, going pro is not your destination and it's no one's destination. Even Tom Brady, who's going to play till he's 90, is going to have to do something after <laughs> he, you know, after he retires. And so and now a lot of these guys have done a great job of starting businesses. And I think we're starting yeah. to see the tide turn among professional right. athletes on, right. on taking more ownership. Um, so it's, it's that, you know, that would be step one. And then step two is, you know, talk to your kids about finance and finance yeah. to me is very, very simple, which is why, mm -hmm. you know, in the book, I translate all the financial topics into the language of sports, right? So yeah. Yeah. whatever, sport you play again we have so many shared experiences regardless of the mm -hmm. sport we play and and it's just using and explaining finance which to a lot of people is a dry topic and uh it and complicated but making it easy to understand and relate to and then just giving them a game plan to yeah. you know starting when you start as a freshman in college or even high school here are things you can do to set yourself up for the future mm -hmm. And we don't know what the future is going to be, but you might as well position right. yourself. You right. know, it's like lifting weights and, mm -hmm. and getting stronger in high school. We don't know what position you're going to go and play in college, but, mm -hmm. but you got to keep building and getting better. Right. And so it's Absolutely. starting that process as early as possible to, mm -hmm. you know, increase the odds of success, whether you go pro or whether you make the decision that, you know, it, 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 not to go pro. Right. You know, you mentioned one thing on step one, I'm going to, I'm going to just, applaud you because I wish I would have thought about this when I was, you know, 20, but there are different kinds of currencies, right? There's financial literacy, financial currency, sure, but that has no soul. It's just money, right? It's just, it's just commodity. But you mentioned something really critical and I think that's bears repeating. And man, if you're, if you've got kids in college or you, you're in college, whatever it is, the connections you make, the human currency of networking can make you millions no matter what you do. And it can yeah. set you up for so many opportunities. The people you meet, those connections are, and I hate to call people currency, but networking, I mean, the, the most successful people I know, yeah, sure, they're financially wealthy, but their Rolodex, if that's even a thing anymore, that's their real, that's their real bank. Yeah, So absolutely. I think that, that could be an actual, um, that could be a, a good second book, actually developing your your, your financial network of, of humans, you know, in your life, because. Oh yeah. I man. mean, life is all about relationships. I mean, yeah. and, and you look at, you know, just this book and everything that's coming out of it, 
Right. It's the relationships that I'm building with a lot of these athletes that are getting yeah. me introduced to more and more athletes, more and more programs. Right. And and it's all based on the relationship. Right. And yeah. without those relationships, you know, I, I would have just I would have been a guy that wrote a book and, you know, that's right. It you know, what's next? And, and, and mom would have bought it. We'd be done. Yeah. Be, yeah. Um, <laughs> you have a copy of the, of the book there handy? Uh, I do. I got mine. Me. You got it behind me? Got one Hold on, I got it uh, I got somewhere. I got mine. It's all right. I'll hold it up you for people. It? Yeah. Right. Oh, I see it. I see it on the on the on the shelf. But yeah. Yeah, it's I was in so, the way. Yeah, this this is this is the book, guys. I'm gonna take you up for a second. I'm gonna put this book on the screen, but um the foundation for financial excellence, right? And it, it is a I'm, you don't even have to be an athlete to really appreciate what Ryan's teaching here. And you have a, a contributor here. You want to talk about Anthony? So going back to relationships, I mean, this was, you know, I got referred to uh, just to talk to Anthony. He 14 mm -hmm. years in the NBA. Uh, I think he's going to retire now, uh, but I don't know. But 14 years, I mean, he's you talk about a senior citizen in any pro league. 14 years is a long time. He just uh, got done playing with Philadelphia. I thought, you know, there was the only time I could really cheer for a Philadelphia based team. Um, but you know, I thought they were going to win, be able to win the, uh, the, uh, NBA championship, but they got knocked out, but you know, he has a very, uh, a strong passion about this. And so he had the idea, instead of just connecting me to people, you know, let's explain these topics from a pro perspective. And so we came up with this idea of Tolliver take, uh, or Tolliver's take, and it's his view of all the topics we talk about, but as a professional athlete. And, you know, some of the things that he's seen and the lessons he's learned and how he's applied them and seen them applied among other professional athletes. So it's amazing. It was some um, and I there's no there's no um, there's no PC way to say this. Right. But, you know, there's a lot of um, perception about, you know, NBA players and these guys, all the, you know, money and girls and stuff. And this man is like he is like he walks on water. I mean, he's like he's just, you know family man, businessman, athlete, well-spoken. He's like, well, heck, you know, he could run the country. Yeah. Just a super guy. I, you know, that that's, you know, I think athletes a lot of times don't get enough credit, you know, yeah. an athlete I think is a small part of who he is, but right. the businesses right. that he's built and that, you know, that I got to learn about after mm -hmm. that, you know, after the yeah. fact and, and getting to know him, I mean, seizing opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, he's, he has built, you know, he's used his NBA money very wisely yeah. and he's created, uh, you know, an empire, quite frankly, mm -hmm. that yep. uh, is going to last in, in generations. Right. And right. his his grandkids, grandkids are going to be positively affected by the decisions right. that he made, you know, uh, with yeah. the money that he had uh, coming out of the league. Yep. Yeah. And well, actually, the, and to be fair, I'm going to guess you tell me if I'm wrong, but the money he made out of the league. At, at either right now or in the future, it will be small pale to what he's done with it, right? The leverage, oh, it the power, is. yeah, it power is. compounding <laughs> interest, and all stuff, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Ryan, uh, yeah, you are you're one of the good guys. You know, there's a lot of uh, people get flack for uh, you know athletes, financial planners, you know, podcast hosts, whatever. But yeah, yeah, it was just a pleasure talking to you today. I'd um, love to have you. Maybe bring Anthony on sometime. We'll we'll talk about this, or we'll bring George on. You introduced me to George Jones. Oh yeah, what absolutely. A super guy. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. I wish he was my dad. He's yeah. like, that's all. He's a good. He's a good yeah. dude, isn't he? He's he's great. We're gonna have to have a, a powwow sometime. It's like one of those ESPN things. We all talk over each other. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so thanks again for being on the show today. Don't forget to get this book, folks. Foundation for Financial Excellence by on, Ryan on Amazon and now. Powers. Pardon me. On Amazon now. It's on Amazon. Go get your copy and get, get, get two. Get one for a friend or a kid. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. We'll, we'll see you again much, much sooner than later. Uh, this is Doug Crow, the Off Your Brand Show. Be sure to click below and subscribe. Opt in, get some goodies from us, and we'll see you next time.